So for today, you're going to study stepper motors. I think you get the idea of a stepper motor. You've probably used a stepper motor before. Today, you're going to go into the de details of how to power them, how to combine them with a uh, nature bridge, for example, and uh, how they work, what kind of, what types of stepper motors are available and what is exactly their working principle. This, uh, lecture is has some animations in it in, in LaTeX. So if you want to see them, I recommend that you download the PDF and open it with Adobe. Uh, with any other software, it is likely that this is not going to work. So to see the uh, motors rotating, uh, please open it with Adobe. Uh, I don't know what it used to annotate the lecture notes, but it's very likely that that software will not work. So for today's lecture, we're going to study the working principle of stepper motors analyze the different uh, methods to construct it, to build a stepper motor and calculate the resolution of a stepper motor. This is very similar to what we studied in the last lecture. The question that you're going to answer today is how can we ensure continuous motion? In the machines we developed so far, we had a torque being developed, but once we reached a certain steady st a certain equilibrium point, the motor was is technically stuck in that position and can ensure a continuous rotation. So how do we do that today? A, there are many applications of stepper motors. The main advantage of a stepper motor is the accuracy and is the fact that a no position feedback is required. You tell the motor where to go and the motor will go to that specific position. There is no need for a position for position feedback. Well, this seems like a very good idea, but there are some drawbacks with the stepper motor. The main one mean that, uh, being that uh, it, they have a very limited speed range, right? but they wouldn't require position control. So stepper motors are typically used for position control, not for speed control because of certain limitations. And another limitation that you have in the stepper motor is the fact that you have discrete positions that the motor can go to. And that's exactly the reason why we don't need a position feedback. So there are some trade-offs here and there. We're going to see them in detail. You have probably used a uh, 3D printer before. And if you look at 3D printer, you'll see that it most likely has a stepper motors. The reason again is that if you want the 3D printer head to go to position X, Y, we can calculate how many steps the motor needs to take to bring the, the, the head from position A to position B. And if you look closer, you will notice that there, are, there is no position feedback. There are uh, some sensors at the end of each uh, linear rail to indicate that it has reached the end, but there is no intermediate sensor uh, sen sensing between the starting and the end of that um, linear motion. And again, this can be used, be, can be accomplished by the fact that we don't need position feedback because we trust the stepper motors. We tell them to go to a certain position and they do. They can be used, as I said, for position control. Another interesting application is for high torque applications. But the uh, again, with the limitation that they have very limited speed. Another big advantage of stepper motors is that can, they can be controlled with a digital controller, such as an Arduino or a computer directly. They will take discrete signals and based on the sequence of discrete signals on or off, we can control the stepper motor to um, give uh, to go to a certain position. Unlike a DC motor where the signal is a voltage that is either positive or negative, here we are dealing with simply digital signals on or off. And depending on the sequence, we control the direction and the position itself. All right, so let's go one step back and go back to lecture 11 before we uh, expand on this concept. Let's consider this simple reluctance motor that we had before. As we studied in, the lecture, in lecture 11, we call this a reluctance motor because the rotor is simply a ferromagnetic part that will be attracted by the, the poles of this machine when, once we apply a voltage to the coils. So if we have a voltage applied to this coil here, a current will be established, the current creates a magnetic field, a magnetic flux. And as a result, the rotor will be subjected to a torque and that torque will tend to align the rotor axis with the magnetic field. And once we reach that specific point in the magnetic field, we are aligned with the magnetic field. Now the resulting torque will be zero and the motor is stuck at that position. 
Another variation of this motor that we, we also came up with was to add a coil to the rotor itself. So I have two coils interacting and depending now on the, um, the, the, the current that applied to each coil that will influence the torque. Now to calculate the total torque in the second case, we need to account for each self-inductance of the coil and the stator, but also, sorry, the rotor and the stator, and also the fact that they now mutually interact through what you call the mutual inductance. So these three terms now give the torque developed by the motor. It, is a it, is, it depends on the derivative of the inductance, and we know that the inductance also depends on in turn depends on the uh, reluctance of the system. And you can clearly see here that as the rotor rotates, the reluctance is changing and therefore there is a torque developed in the rotor. But this is it. Now we have a simple machine that will provide torque in one direction, a limited range of motion, because once again, when you are aligned with the, mag the magnetic flux, the torque becomes zero. The torque becomes zero and the rotor cannot, the continued rotation of this motor cannot be ensured. So how do we do that? Well, we partially answered that question in the last lecture. If we want now the motor to go, let's say it aligns vertically with the magnetic flux and you want that to go back horizontally, we can simply copy the entire circuit and rotate it 90 degrees. And that's the idea behind a stepper motor. Here it is, two identical systems that we had before, but they are now at a 90 degree angle. What happens here? Well, I think you guess you, you get the idea. If you apply a voltage there, then there is a magnetic flux coming here. And as a result, the rotor will align itself with that magnetic flux. If we now apply a voltage to motor to the second coil that we added, then there is a magnetic flux going that way or the other way, depending on the direction of the current. And as a result, the rotor aligns itself with that magnetic flux. Right? And now we can, uh, we can do coil A, the rotor is vertical. We can do coil B, is, it goes to a horizontal position. What happens if we activate both coils at the same time? Well, we can add the resulting magnetic fluxes. If we had one like that for A and one like this for B, once both are activated, we can simply add them up and we have the flux AB when both coils are actuated. Right, so we now have three positions here, vertical 45 degrees and horizontal at um, B. Right. The orientation of the magnetic flux can be controlled, but once again, at a discrete position. In this case here, we can clearly see we have three specific positions that we can go to. And uh, now the direction of that magnetic flux can also be controlled by reversing the current in the coils. In the case of a stepper motor, would that change the torque developed? In, in the case of a reluctance motor, would that have an effect on the direction of the torque if we change the current direction? No. No, it would not because uh, as we saw, the torque depends on the square of the current and because of that, it doesn't matter in which way the magnetic flux is applied. However, if we replace the rotor with a permanent magnet, that will now play a role. Right? So we'll see the different uh, methods to build a stepper motor shortly. So stepper motors are synchronous DC motors. They are called synchronous DC motors because they follow the direction of the magnetic flux in the state. It's up to us to control the direction and position of the, the, the magnetic flux and the rotor will always follow that. And that's why it's called a synchronous machine. There are many types of stepper motors. We can classify them by rotor type by as a reluctance motor where the core is simply a ferromagnetic part, a permanent magnet motor where now the rotor becomes a permanent magnet or hybrid motors where you have a combination of both. We can also classify them based on how they are wired as unipolar or bipolar motors. And you can also classify them based on their motion accuracy or the size of each step, full step, half step, or micro step. 
So the principle of operation is relatively simple. Again, now our, our job will be to define the sequence of actuation to ensure a continuous rotation, also calculate how accurate, what is the minimum step that the motor can take. And um, that's what we're going to see next. Okay, so if you open this in Adobe, you will see the top uh, animation there working. It's not working here, but if you open that with Adobe, it should be fine. So let's start with the simplest case. Here we have a four phase. We have four independent coils. That's what I mean by phase. We have two poles, uh, north and south in the rotor. We're going to define a pole as a, po a, a, a pair of north and south uh, poles. That's uh, each of them is a, sorry, let me restate that. As the rotor is, is magnetized, it will create a north and south side and the, each of them is a pole. Right? And if you count the pole pairs, that would be one pole pair or one path for the magnetic flux. And you have four phases, that is four coils. Let's see the first example here. The first example, we actuate the top coil. And as we actuate the top coil, a magnetic flux will be established and we see how the magnetic flux loops around the stator and through the rotor. Right. And as a result, then the magnetic flux uh, will make the rotor align itself in the vertical position like that. So this is, let's call this position A. Now we can go to position B. We can actuate a coil on the, on the right and the rotor will now jump from A to B. And you see the path the magnetic flux takes right there. Now we can do coil C. Again, another 90 degree rotation and eventually coil D for uh, 180 degree rotation, uh, 270 degree rotation, sorry. So for each interval, for each step, for each change in the coil we are actuating, we are making the rotor move by 90 degrees. Right. We can calculate that, we can create a formula for that. One rotation is 360 degrees. If you divide this by the number of phases and by the number of pole pairs, we can calculate the accuracy or the step size of this motor. So for this particular example here, we have 360 divided by the number of phases, that is four, and the number of uh, pole pairs is one. We have two poles, one pair, and this gives an accuracy of 90 degrees. So for each sequence, for each step, the motor moves by 90 degrees. So this is a single phase operation uh, with what you call full step. Full step meaning that one phase is activated at a time and you take the largest possible step per um, every time. Now let's go uh, to a double phase operation. In a double phase operation, we are actuating two coils at the same time. Just give me one second here. I think your sound is coming from a different source and it's a bit distracting. Okay, it should be good. All right, so now the same idea, but you are actuating two coils at the same time. And as we saw before, when you do two coils, let's say A and B, each of them creates its own magnetic flux and you can simply add them up to determine where the resulting magnetic flux is and where the resulting rotor position will be. So when you do position, uh, when you do AB, we are at a 40, 45 degrees. Now we can do BC to go to 135 degrees. And we can, you can keep going on and on. So as we uh, actuate a pair of coils, you see that the resulting magnetic field magnetic flux will follow that orientation. Why would you do this? Why would you actu actuate two coils at the same time instead of simply one at a full step? Any, any ideas? Is it more accuracy? It is more accuracy. Well, compared to the previous one, what is the resolution here? What is the step size? It's, it's still 90 degrees. 
Now we are still jumping by 90 degrees. We can see that in each step, the motor moves by 360 divided by phase times number of whole pairs. And in this case, because you're doing full step, it's still 90 degrees. It is for accuracy, but we need to use that in a different way. But for now, the only uh, advantage compared to the previous one would be the higher torque because you have two coils acting instead of one. Right. The downside is that it will take also two times more power to create that torque. And you don't get two times more torque. We get around 30 to 40% more torque. Right. So let me ask the question again, then uh, reformulate the question now that I had the information that this could be used for accuracy. How can we combine these two modes to increase accuracy? The single phase and the double phase. How would you increase accuracy? For if you use single phase or the double phase full step, we are at 90 degrees. So nothing changes, only the torque changes. How we increase accuracy? What if we use? Um, yep. Yeah. Like Sorry, alternating between them because one will give you the vertical, one will then give you the 45. Precisely. You're going to alternate between these two operating modes. We'll, we'll go. We use the full step. Uh, we go from full step to what you call a half step operation because you now actuate one coil and two coils and one coil and two coil and coils and so on. And here is the idea. So in the first step, we actuate coil A. We have the rotor pointing upwards like that. In the second step, now we go A, B. So we have A and B, and we have the resulting magnetic flux pointing at a 45 degree angle as opposed to 90 degrees. And now we go to coil B. So that we take this intermediate step between A and B. And now we are jumping at intervals of 45 degrees instead of 90. And if you go continue, this would be B, C. What would be the next step? Would be C. And the next one would be. So we go A, A, B, A, uh, B, then B, C. Then what is the next one? A, A, B, 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 C. What is the fifth one? It would be C. And then C, D. C, D. And then D. And then A, D. And then the cycle, the, the cycle repeats. All right. So like this, we now go at a 45 degree angle. And because you're using half step, now we can simply divide our equation by two. And we still have four poles, we still have, um, sorry, four phases, we still have one pole pair. And but now our accuracy is 45 degrees as opposed to 90 degrees. And we call this half a step uh, mode. Okay, any, any questions so far? Question. Yep. If this is just an understanding thing, if you hold, let's say you're working with A and B. If you hold the A and the B uh, signals on, will it stay in a diagonal position or will it still go force itself to a 90 degree position and you have to alternate between the two? As soon as you hold the, co the coil on, it will be aligned with that uh, resulting vector. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, yeah. So when you go from, let's say, A, B to B, you need to turn this off and turn the next one on. Or basically just turn coil A off. Right? And then uh, it goes to coil B. Uh, just as a, remind, a reminder, or sorry, were you still finishing that, that uh, answer? No, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, just as a reminder, what's the pole pair again? The pole pair, so if you look at the rotor, we have the magnetic flux passing through the rotor. It will create a north and south pole. South pole. Okay. All right, so here, we, if, you, if you consider that it goes from north to, to south, it will create these two poles. It will come into play later. And this is one pole pair. Okay. It only holds if the motor is symmetric. Right? If, the, if the rotor is not symmetric, then we have to use something else. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. All right, so that's a very poor resolution for our motor, only 45 degrees. You know, for position control, it's, uh, it's very rough. We need something 
more fine, finer, something more uh, fluid to ensure continuous motion. And that's where a multipole reluctance motor comes into play. So we can add more poles to the rotor. In this example here, how many pole pairs we have? We have three, there are six poles, so three pairs. And what can we see? Let's say we go with uh, coils A and B. If you go with coils A and B, the resulting vector for coil A is, sorry, the resulting flux for coil A and B is given here. And when you turn it on, now the rotor axis, that is the closest one to that uh, vector, we will align itself with that a vector. So what is the step resolution here? Let's say, for example, we started by actuating only coil A. So when you did coil A, the rotor aligned itself here. Now we are going to do coil AB for by how much does the rotor rotate? By the smallest difference between one of the poles and the magnetic flux itself. So it's going to rotate by, if the magnetic flux goes at 45 degrees, the closest pole is the one at a 30 degrees. So this is going to rotate by 45 minus, 50, minus 30, which is 15 degrees. You can see that on the animation on the right. Okay, and what would be the next step? So let's say we did A, now we did uh, A, B. What would be the next one for uh, rotation in the same direction? What would be the closest one in the next step? So if we actuate A, B, the rotor rotates slightly counterclockwise by, 30, by 15 degrees. So if you, if you think about the next step, what would that one be? Couldn't sure. So, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Thirty. The uh, next step would also have to be fifteen degrees. Would also have to be fifteen degrees. But I didn't ask my question correctly. Which coil should we actuate next? Are we spinning clockwise or counterclockwise? We are going counterclockwise. Okay. So would it be counterclockwise? Easy? It would be a D, it would be, it could be a D. Yeah, it could be a D or it could also be simply B. It could be a D, but a B also works to, for a smoother transition, B would be, uh, would also create uh, a clockwise, counterclockwise rotation of, at the same amount of 15 degrees. Okay, so now what I have here, we have six pairs, uh, uh, six poles, three pole pairs. So what is our accuracy? It's 360 divided by four phases, four coils times three pole pairs should give 15 degrees. All right, so by each, the more uh, pole pairs we have, the smaller the step size and the smoother the rotation will be. Any questions so far? Just a quick question. It's a clarification. Yep. But um, is it always turning clockwise? Or this one is, is it? This, well, we can make it go either way, depending on the direction of motion we want to, to, to have. All right. If we started now with coil, which other coil we could do? If we do coil D, for example, uh, it could go in the other direction. Right? It, it, we can uh, we can ensure rotation in in um, in the direction we want. It is a bit hard to see in the very first step, but as we start to create a sequence, then it becomes more evident that it's going to go in one direction or the other. But depending on the sequence, it can go clockwise or counterclockwise. There's no problem. Right? I think it's more uh, more visible here. Here we are going clearly going clockwise, but if it's, when you go from the first step to the second step, if you do, instead of A, uh, go to AB, we go to AD, then it goes counterclockwise. 
It really depends on the sequence we actuate. So if you go A, A, B, it goes clockwise. If you go A, A, D, then it's counterclockwise, and then you continue the sequence from there. This one is a bit harder to see because we can't really see how you know, there, there are six poles. It's hard to see which one is the closest to a phase, but it will work on the same principle. So if we go for, from A to D, would, would it be minus 45 or would it also be 45 just counterclockwise? It, it, it would be, so if we go A, B, it will go like that. And if we go A, D, let's assume for example, that, uh, let me pick one. Let's assume for example, that this will, would be the closest, this is the vector there, and this would be the closest to the magnetic flux. So it would go like this. If you just do D. Uh, or if you do AD, it's a bit hard to see in the picture. That's why it's a bit confusing. So it, let's say we do AD, then the flux goes like that, and then rotation would be in the other direction. Does that make more sense now? Uh, I was asking more for the, the four phase two pole. The four I, phase uh, two. Oh, the four, the this one? This, yeah. 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 Sorry, could you repeat your question then? So if it's, you, you said we can turn it on from, instead of A, B, it can be A, D. A, or D, after yeah. A, we turn on D. So then with the degrees, would it be minus 45 degrees? Yes, it would be minus 45 degrees. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and this one would be either 15 or negative 15. And we can continue this, we can add more. Uh, here we have three phases. These phases are uh, represented by these elements. One phase is one element here. This entire thing here is one phase and the coil is coming in and out there. Now, so we have three of them, three phases. We can add more. There's probably another phase that is wired in, par in series with that one down here. And now we have a certain number of teeth instead of poles. And to calculate the accuracy here, we can simply do 360 divided by the number of phases, three times divided by also the number of rotor teeth, in this case, 11. So the accuracy would be 360 divided by 11 times three. Okay. Which offers a much better accuracy than before. And this is the uh, micro-stepping, a uh, micro-step reluctance motor. Uh, and we'll also see how to do micro-stepping for a motor that doesn't have as many teeth. We could do, in fact, micro-stepping with this one as well, if you now do a um, voltage modulation of each coil and control, remember, space vector space modulation, where you could go from two different positions discreetly. We could do the same here and then ensure that it has a more uh, continuous rotation if required. A but question? for a better, yes, go ahead. Uh, if we're reducing um, if, if we're reducing the number of phases, um, aren't we reducing accuracy too? Yes, yes, yes. If you're reducing the number of phases, you're reducing accuracy. So the so more this, phases- this, this three phase motor is gonna be less accurate than like a four phase one? If we had four phases, we'd get a better accuracy. But the fact here is that we have more teeth than the other one, this would be more accurate in that regards. Uh, but if you only account for the number of phases for a similar motor with the same number of poles, yes, then the more, the fewer phases, the less accurate the motor becomes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so those are the configurations for what it called a reluctance motor, three different configurations. And it, it's a reluctance motor because the rotor is only a ferromagnetic part. Now let's change things a bit and let's add a permanent magnet in the rotor instead. Now, as you know, if you take two magnets and you put both the same sides together, uh, there will be a, a force between them. So if the poles are opposite, it's an attraction force. Otherwise, it's uh, the, the force will repulse both sides. Now becomes the, the, now comes the question, in which direction should the magnetic flux go? So let's see this first. 
example here. We have a bipolar stepper motor. We have one phase, uh, one winding per phase, per, per phase uh, pair. Let's say A, for example, comes this way, goes around the rotor, and then goes to the other phase, and then comes back. So when you activate coil A, it's going to activate both sides of that rotor. It's uh, connected in series. And you have a permanent magnet in the center. Let's assume that the magnetic flux goes from south to north, as in the little uh, schematic there. So what happens now? Well, now depending on the direction of the magnetic the current, the magnetic flux will follow a given direction. Let's take coil B as an example, and let's see what happens in coil B. If we apply a, apply a positive voltage to coil B, sorry, this is coil A. Coil A here, A minus A plus. If you apply a positive voltage to coil A, then you have a current flowing in this direction. And now we need to look at the way it's wired. And it is wired, if you look at my hand right now, the current would come down from the left, the right side would come down here, and then rotate this way, and rotate that way. In which way is the magnetic flux? It rotates this way. So the magnetic flux, if you use the right-hand rule, magnetic flux points to the right. All right. So the current comes down and rotates like that. So the magnetic flux points that way. And if we apply a negative voltage, then we can follow the direction of the current and the magnetic flux will go in the other direction. In the first case, the magnetic flux goes like that. So we have a south and a north pole like that. And the magnet itself has a, according to our convention, north and south pole. In which direction does the rotor rotate, clockwise or counterclockwise? That's the clockwise, right? Clockwise, right? And opposite poles will attract and the motor goes clockwise. Now in the second case, well, now we guessed because we are, the magnetic flux goes on from the stator's perspective from the right to the left. Now we have a south and north pole like that. So now the rotor will rotate counterclockwise because you have the same poles on one side. So there'll be a force uh, making the rotor rotate counterclockwise. Right? So the rotor rotates like that and here it rotates like that. Okay, what is the difference compared to the previous one? Well, the previous example here, it doesn't matter in, in which way the current goes. It, what it matters is the resulting magnetic flux, right? The, in, in, the physical resulting magnetic flux for, for the coils. The direction it goes is not necessarily important because there is a reluctance motor. It doesn't matter. We'll, the rotor will always be attracted by the magnetic flux. This is not the case here because it now can go also in the opposite direction away from the magnetic flux because you have a permanent magnet. So now the direction of the current matters, which means that to control this thing, we'll need to reverse the current. The other one doesn't need that. We can only be positive or negative with a MOSFET and the job is done. This one now requires that the, uh, it requires the reversal of the current for control. So let's uh, develop this a bit in more detail. So here we have the bipolar stepper motor. Again, these animations will show in your copy better. And let's uh, let's just start with the left one. In step one, we wanted to align with the uh, vertical axis. So if you do coil, we are clearly dealing with coil uh, A. So this for, uh, as a reminder, would be coil so I call coil B, this is coil B, and this one here is coil A. All right, so if you want it to go vertical, we need to create a magnetic flux that it will create a uh, south, which one is the, the north and south pole like that. And that determines the direction of the current, that determines the direction of the voltage we need to apply to that coil. So when we start with 
uh, coil A is zero and coil B is positive, the orientation of the magnetic flux will be such that we have a north pole on the top and a south pole at the bottom, and then the magnet aligns itself like that. We can now actuate coil a, either positive or negative. So if you want to ensure counterclockwise direction, uh, rotation, in this specific case, it would be negative. The magnetic flux will create a north pole here, a south pole there, and then it drags the rotor in the counterclockwise direction. If you reverse the current, if we now, if you look at the example here, now we have a positive voltage instead. So the magnetic flux will go the other way and will create a south north pole like that. So it goes to the right uh, and then it drags the rotor in the opposite direction. And then you can continue the process, uh, of course, while we pay attention to the direction of the current that will be required to create the uh, necessary magnetization of the core. Notice that this is not a uh, a table that applies to every motor, it really depends on how it is wired. You see that in the diagrams, you don't need to pay attention in which way to which way the current rotates around the core. In this example here, it goes from the back of that stator, and then it comes to the front and then it rotates like this. I don't know if you can see my hand, but it comes from the back and then it loops to the front and then it goes to the back and loops to the front. Right, so it low it goes like that, which means that our magnetic flux would be pointing to the left. Okay, is this clear? Is the principle of operation of bipolar stepper motors clear? Any any questions? If this is not clear, let, uh, I can explain again. Sir, can you please repeat it again, like the direction thing? Okay, so let's go back here. Um, where did I put it? Oh, actually, unfortunately, I don't have the diagram I meant to have. Okay, never mind. So we'll go back here. Uh, let's see, it starts with this one. I think it's easier. So we have a magnet in the center. The magnet has a south and a north pole. Now let's see what happens if you take coil B, which is the horizontal coil, and we actuate coil B in a way that we apply a voltage like that, positive, negative. If that is the case, current comes in like that. Sorry. Coil B, that's actually, let's do coil A because it's the representation that I have here. Plus minus like that. So current flows this way. If current flows this way, in which way does the current now rotate around the rotor? Well, the current comes from the front of that that is stator, right? The current comes from the front and goes to the back and then goes back to the front. So it rotates like this. So if it rotates like that, we can use the right-hand rule to determine the direction of the magnetic flux. It's going to point right to the right. It's pointing to the right. So the magnetic flux goes like that. If the magnetic flux goes like that. According to our convention, the magnetic flux goes from south to north, so this creates a south pole, and this side here becomes the north pole. Now, south is attracted by the north pole, the rotor rotates clockwise. If you reverse the current, we now take this same phase, and we reverse the current, we put the voltage upside down, now the current goes like that. So the current is going like that, is getting in here. So now it's going from the back and to the front, from the back and to the front, All right? So it's going to go in the opposite direction and the magnetic flux reverses. The magnetic flux goes like that. So now we have a south and the north pole that is flipped. And as it is flipped, now the rotor rotates in the opposite direction. 
okay? And here the idea now is to consider the phase uh, sequence that we need to make a continuous rotation, but now also we need to pay attention to the direction of the voltage we apply. If we want, let's say, to go from the position shown to the position to the right, we need to create a magnetic flux that it goes in this direction. I go to align itself to create a north pole in the uh, necessary location to attract or repel the magnet. All right? Does that make more sense? Yeah. No. So so in the in the graph, when it says negative V, that just means that the polarity is switched. Yes, that means the polarity of the voltage is switched. So our, by convention, we have, let's say, let's go back here one more time. We have A and A plus. So because this is A plus, when you do voltage like this, so this is V plus, and when you reverse the voltage, now we are connecting the negative side of the voltage to A plus, that becomes V minus. Right. And this is the sequence of operation for this particular bipolar motor. Now, how do we control this? Well, we need to reverse the current. So a simple, a simple MOSFET on and off will not be enough. So let's uh, use our famous H bridge. So each coil now requires an H bridge, it requires a inverter. And in this case here, let's see our first example. We have coil B going at positive side here, negative side there, being connected to that H bridge whose control signals are Q1 and Q2. So what are what happens if you do Q1 and Q2 0, 0? What is the voltage across the coil B? Back to lecture six. A short circuit. Is that a short circuit or an open circuit? That's an open circuit, right? Both. All transistors are open. There is no connection between the power source and the, um, the coil. So this would be zero volts, but if we do one, one, that is both are conducting, both legs are conducting, then uh, it would be a short circuit. And that's precisely why it's not used. So one, one would not be used. What happens if you do zero, one? What is the voltage across the motor? Zero, one. Vs. It would be Vs. It would be plus V, right? Because current would be flowing uh, like like zero one would be flowing like that. So going in from the positive side. So according to that convention, it would be plus Vs. And conversely, if you go from the other side, that it would be negative V. Our current now flows in the opposite direction. Let's look, this, the same applies to phase A. Phase A has its own bridge, but now we're dealing with Q3 and Q4. So zero, zero is zero volts. Zero, one, according to this arrangement here, it would be plus V again, and one zero would be negative V. All right, same that we used in lecture six, but now we have two H bridges, one, Per coil. Any any questions here? Uh, can you describe how uh, it's plus and negative? Yeah. So this is uh, from lecture six. So if we do Q one zero and you do Q two equals to one, Q two equals to one. So when Q1 is zero, this doesn't conduct and this doesn't conduct, correct? And when you do Q1 equals to one, then this transistor conducts and this transistor conducts. So current goes from VCC through this transistor through the positive leg as we defined in the current, in, in the coil. And that's by definition then positive. 
If current was being applied through the negative side, then it would mean that the current would be coming out from the positive side and would be negative. But that's a convention that we are using, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? What are the benefits of using the stepper motor versus the reluctance motor? These, the uh, bipolar motor would have higher torque. Certainly would have higher torque. Yeah. That's I think okay, the, main, the main advantage. And also only has four wires. Uh, the reluctance motor is going to see later. Uh, bipolar motor with a permanent magnet would have six. All right, so if we have here zero, so plus V minus V, zero plus V minus V, we can go back to this and I'll see what sequence we need. Let's say, for example, uh, if you want to follow this uh, sequence here, we can look at a, the required Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 to apply phase one. Phase A would be zero. So Q3 and Q4 would take zero. And B would take plus 90, uh, plus V. And that would then require zero, one. When you move to step two, now we need A to be negative. So that would be B would be deactivated for a full step. That would be zero, zero. And A would take negative V. So that would take one, zero. Right, and, uh, and so on. You can now continue the process with this discrete uh, actuation of each coin. All right, so that's for the bipolar. Now let's move on to unipolar stepper motors. The idea is exactly the same, but the way we generate a magnetic flux is a slightly different. We still have a permanent magnet and it's still the direction of the magnetic flux matters. But the way the coils are actuated are slightly different. We are now going to take one coil and I'm going to split that coil into two. We have a neutral wire, let's say coil A, we have a neutral wire that is halfway through the coil and it creates a ground there. If we now send a current from positive, from A, current goes in one way. If you send a current from the other end of the, the coil, current goes in the other way, but it goes to the neutral. Which means that the voltage we apply to A can be positive all the time. If this is positive, the current flows like that. All right, so the magnetic flux points down. And if you apply the current through the other side of the coil, which is again, a positive voltage, then we have the current going like that and the magnetic flux points up. Right. It's the same idea, but the only difference is now the fact that we have a neutral point at the center of the coil which allows us to only apply positive voltages. Now the question is through which side of the coil, through the, the uh, through A or what I call here A prime um, at the, the, the bottom. Uh, and the, but the, the rest of the idea is relatively, is exactly the same once we establish a magnetic flux, the motor works exactly the same way. What happens if you actuate both sides of the coil at the same time? What happens if we do positive there and positive here? What is the resulting magnetic flux? Would be zero. Would be There's zero, one. exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. One coil pushes up, the other one pushes down, it's zero, nothing moves. So that's how we now control the direction of the current. So it's easy to identify a, a unipolar stepper motor. Now we see that unipolar stepper motor, when you buy them, we have this four wires here. And we have also two neutrals. I connected them together, but we, all, we would see two neutrals there. So when you look at the stepper motor and you see six wires, that's an indication that you're dealing with a unipolar motor. If you see only four wires, that's a bipolar motor. The bipolar motor requires current inversion the unipolar motor does not, but it now has six wires. So taking that into consideration, 
we can define a driver to power this motor. How, what, what would you do? What would you use based on the previous lectures from power electronics? What would you use now to control this motor? We don't need an H bridge. What, what can you use instead? Any any guesses? Any suggestions? Any? Is it a half bridge? We we could use a half bridge, but we don't need to reverse the voltage. So a simply DC to DC converter on and off is enough. We could use a half bridge for the other one, but the, the idea of a half bridge is to reverse the current, which is not required here. So we can simply use four MOSFETs like this. And when they are on or off, we're actuating one at a time. When they're on or off, we actuate one half of the coil. We make the flux go in one way or another. And through that process, we can ensure continuous rotation. And that's the advantage of the unipolar motor. No current reversal, unlike the bipolar motor where that is required. Here is the sequence for actuation for this particular motor. We can go with coil A first. The rotor aligns itself like that. If you follow all the rules, when you do coil B, the magnetic flux will go that way and then drag the rotor al along. Then you can do to, to go uh, 180 degrees A prime, a complement of A. So it flips like that. So this would be B. And you can do B prime to go the other way. So the correct actuation for full step would be A, B. A, B, A prime, B prime. And if you go counterclockwise, we have the sequence there. How can we convert this into a half step? If you go A, A, B, A prime, B prime, we go counterclockwise. If we go, how would we uh, do half step there? Would we you do uh, the, the A, A, B, then B? Exactly. Is that a, 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 B, then B, then A prime, A prime, B, then A prime, and so on. Right? And this ensures a 45 degree rotation. All right. Okay, let's do a little bit of modeling. Uh, we know Professor, how this... question? Yes. Um, how do you control uh, the step sizes for, um, for Stepper motors with the permanent. Well, the step size for what you can do here would be, uh, we don't really have much control over it. We can do full step or half step. But if you want to do things uh, in a bit more complicated way, we can take this driver and you can now modulate a PWM signal in each coil. Let's say, for example, if you take coil A and A and B, we could create this vector, resulting vector like that. We know where the rotor aligns itself, but if we only do this much in one of the coils, then you see that uh, the other one to keep that the same amount, we see that the resulting vector now changes direction. So by modulating the actual value of the voltage using a PWM signal in each coil, we could make that vector rotate in the same way we did for the three phase inverters lecture. That's one way. The other way is to simply increase the number of phases or increase the number of rotor poles. The latter is probably more common. In a, a hybrid motor, we have uh, uh, several teeth that have magnets and some that are don't or some that are pointing in one way and the other way. So the only way to increase the step size typically is either by adding more phases, by adding more teeth, more, more magnet, poles or do that electronically by controlling the magnitude of the voltages from one phase to another. And that's a uh, micro-stepping. I believe you're going to do that in the lab. You will be given a motor with a very high resolu uh, low resolution. And then through modulation of the voltage, we'll be able to ensure more continue, continuous rotation. OK? But uh, if micro-stepping electronically is not an option, then the only way to control the step size there is no way to control the step size. It is defined by how many poles and phases uh, the motor has. Okay. Well, let's do a little bit of modeling. We know that as the rotor rotates, 
the inductance changes because the reluctance of the circuit is changing. We can now model our circuit simply by saying that it's a uh, LR circuit and we have a back EMF. This is back EMF that occurs from the fact that the rotor rotates. There is a change in reluctance, which results in a changing magnetic flux. Changing magnetic flux means a induced back EMF in the core, in the coils. And that is represented here by that voltage E. We can make an assumption after an empirical assumption that the inductance will follow equation three. So it's simply what we see in this graph, the average inductance and the modulation of that average inductance with the variation of the inductance itself following the number of poles we have. The total torque is the torque that each coil applies to the rotor. Right, not only one coil, the sum of all torques. And if you now take the uh, inductance, which uh, from which you can calculate the reluctance as N squared over L, we can also determine the magnetic flux as Ni over R. And from this, we can calculate the back EMF as N times the derivative of the flux over dt. And when you combine all that, this is what we see. This is the... Uh, back EMF generated by the coil. In the coil, we see that it depends on the strength of the current we apply. It depends on this sign of M uh, theta, which comes from the variations in the reluctance. And it depends on the derivative of the position of the rotor itself. Right, so the speed, the, the speed of the rotor, the faster it rotates, the more back EMF is generated. That makes perfect sense. Uh, did someone have a question? No? Okay. All right, so this is just to say, we don't need to go into de the details here. This is nothing really new. Now this equation is the same equation we had before, but now if you have multiple phases, we need to add the torque generated by each phase. And at the end, this is what we have. We have a torque that depends on two things. It depends on a constant that will come from all the parameters of the circuit itself depends on the strength of the current and depends also on the position. If the rotor is aligned with the magnetic flux, there is zero torque. That doesn't mean that uh, there is you can rotate it. What, what I mean by zero torque is what we call in a stepper motor a holding torque. If the rotor is exactly up aligned with the magnetic field like that, let's say for a double phase operation, the motor, it reaches equilibrium, is not subjected to a torque, but there is a holding torque. And the holding torque, that's what you see in a data sheet when you buy a stepper motor, is how much torque you need to apply to take the rotor out of that position. Right? But the actual torque that applied by the coils to the rotor at this specific configuration is zero. It's zero because the rotor is aligned with the magnetic flux. So the angle between the magnetic flux and the rotor position determines the maximum torque as well. Here is the main problem with a stepper motor, is a very low response time. Because the all the ferromagnetic part uh, has a high re uh, permeability, the reluctance is small, and therefore the inductance of the system is very, very high. We now need to consider the response time, which is the inductance divided by the resistance, L over R. And this is what bounds the speed. Remember that to develop a current, in a LR circuit, we need to take an exponential curve like that. And this exponential curve takes some time to raise to rise to the maximum current value. So the faster you go, the lower the maximum current, the lower the torque developed in the motor. And that's the main limitation is the response time due to a very high inductive nature of the coils. Another consideration that you can see here, if we take a dynamic model that we are going to skip and um, observe the actual position of the rotor. It's not a perfect transition from zero degrees to say 45 degrees to nine degrees. Every time it goes from zero to 45 degrees, there is a little bit of overshoot before it settles. And then when you go from 45 to 90, there is a little bit of overshoot and then it settles again. All right, so this is the actual uh, position, but, the, but this overshoot may be very small or non-existent, but it's something to consider when designing 
these motors. And it, this all can be calculated. Any questions before we do some exercises? No? Could you uh, once more just repeat the end of slide, uh, this slide that you were on? Uh, which part, the overshoot or the response time? Uh, both, from the windings having the high inductance, just that, yeah, bottom half of the slide if possible. Thanks. Yeah. So the inductance is defined as N squared over the reluctance. They used to have a uh, very high magnetic, uh, magnetomotive force, so N is going to be high. And the idea is because everything is ferromagnetic, R is going to be very low. So the inductance is significantly high. We are dealing with a L, uh, LR circuit. So we can represent the circuit as something like that. And we are going to apply a voltage here and that it develops a current. The current is what develops the torque according to the equation we had before here, depends on the current squared. So the strength, the magnitude of the current determines how much torque we get. This is, uh, if you calculate the response for this LR circuit, you know that the current is going to be one over LS plus R times the step voltage, let's say one over S. And this gives a response for the current in the form of, let me see, one over R, one minus exponential of minus L over RT, something like this, right? That's the actual current in the circuit. If we plot it, is going to be something like that and it tends to one over R and it will take four times tau to reach that, four times the, the time constant. The time constant is L over R, which means that a tau will be very high. The, the time it takes for the current to develop to its fully, full value of one over R is significant. If we don't give enough time for the coils to go from zero to uh, one over R, then we are not developing the full current, which means that as we increase the switching frequency of the coil as the rotor rotates faster, the less current we see in the coils and therefore the less torque we'll see. If we apply a switching frequency to the motor, let's say you go from A to B and to C and you do that very fast, at one point, the motor simply vibrates, it doesn't rotate anymore because it doesn't have enough time to let the current develop. Okay, thank you, yeah. Okay, for the second part, I just want to acknowledge that there is some overshoot as the rotor goes from position A to position B because there is low friction. It's going to oscillate before it settles. That's pretty much it. Awesome, yeah, thank okay. you. Sure. Yes, go ahead. Uh, just, uh, I'm sorry, in, in the last graph, uh, if you would, on the bottom right, so um, as time goes by, the shaft angle increases. Does it eventually go back to like its original position when the, when the magnet like? Well, it depends on how you calculate the shaft angle. If you uh, define the angle, uh, by angle, what I mean is this. Let's say this angle here. If you keep going in the same direction, it always increases. If you keep going in the same direction, it always increases. You go from zero to 90, 180, 360, 450, and so on. If you go back and forth, then yes, then it would decrease. If you go, if you do a full rotation clockwise, you, you reach 360, and you then go a rotation counterclockwise, you go back to zero. It is just the way the uh, way theta is defined. Okay, okay thank you. So. All right, so let's do some Questions? exercises. Yes, go ahead. Sorry about that. Uh, so for equation four, this might be kind of a dumb question, but do you need to take into account the mutual inductances between like two phases being activated at the same time? Yes, yes, yeah, we, 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 we have to, for sure. Okay. Yeah. And so it's just a simplified version here to, um, to give you an idea of how the torque is calculated, but yes, the mutual inductance, in fact, this will be most likely the mutual inductance if we assume that an inductance of it, the self-inductances are constant. The mutual inductance will see a higher change. So equation four would indeed apply if you consider the mutual inductance, uh, that the graph represents the mutual inductance of one coil, one coil pair. 
Sorry, thank you. Yeah. All right, so let's do exercise 52. We have a three phase reluctance step motor. It has a winding resistance of one ohm and an inductance of 30 millihenry and a rated current of three amps. Design a unipolar driver circuit such that the electrical time constant is two milliseconds at a phase turn on and one millisecond at phase turn off. So don't look at the solution for now for the, on the last slide. Just tell me what kind of driver would you propose to actuate this? It's a unipolar circuit, right? So you don't need an H bridge. How would you interface this with, let's say a microcontroller? MOSFETs. MOSFETs, MOSFETs should be enough. What else can we uh, see here? They said the MOSFETs are enough. So that's that for the driver. But there is a trick. The trick is that if we want the electrical time constant to be two milliseconds at turn on and one millisecond at a turn off. How are we going to accomplish that? Let's see what our time constant is first. So here is our circuit. We have one ohm for this resistor. And you have here 30 millihenry for the inductor. As uh, we saw before, the current here will follow. If you apply a voltage there, we have we can calculate the current as 1 over Ls plus R times the magnitude of the voltage divided by S. This is the step input to that voltage there. And the, the time constant uh, or the time response would be 1 over R, 1 minus E L R T. So now, depending on this time constant, that determines how much time the current takes to rise. And we want that to be 2 milliseconds for turn uh, on and 1 millisecond for turn off. What is our current time constant? As it stands, the time constant is L over R, which is 30 millihenry divided by 1. It's 30 milliseconds. Our current time constant is 30 milliseconds. How can we change that? You can adjust you increase like the power. resistance. So the question, the answer I heard was adjust the resistance. What was the first one? Adjust like the amount of time, like we have the switch on for like the effective resistance. Well, we don't really don't really have control on the duty cycle if you're just doing one on off here. Uh, so the only way is indeed to change the resistance because the inductance is part of the system we cannot change. This resistance is the total resistance in the system. So we could maybe add another resistance here on top of the resistance that we have and then adjust the time constant. But that would affect the turn on and turn off time constant. So here is a potential solution to that. Here is the circuit I recommend. So we have the voltage source that it goes through this additional resistor that we added to now change R here and therefore decrease the time constant. This is the resistance of the winding. This is the inductance. And now we can add also a freewheeling diode here with another resistance for the turn off time. So let's see, the, the transistor, the MOSFET is here. So when the MOSFET is turned on, current goes like that. Right, this is the turn on current. It goes from the power source through our L, through one, through the coil and like this. When this is open, current is trapped in inductor and now can be dissipated through this loop. This would be the current during the off state. And it goes through the diode that we've reversed here through this coil. So now we have two different time constants. We have a time constant on that will depend on this path. And you have a time constant off that depends on this path as it turned off. Is the working principle of this clear? Uh, sir, can you explain why the diode's there? Yeah. So let's do turn on first. When you do turn on, what do you have? Turn on the current goes, let me see if I can write it properly. It goes like that. Right, this is the I on. Right, this, this diode is reversed biased. Current cannot go through it. 
So we have, uh, I'll, I'll, go, I'll do this one first and then we explain why the diode is there. So what is the uh, time constant? Time constant would be L over R plus R L here that we added. And we want this to be, what is the time on? Uh, two milliseconds. We want this to be two milliseconds. This gives now L is 30 milli Henry. R is the resistance we had before is one plus RL equals to two milliseconds. We solve for RL and this gives RL equals to um, 14. 14, yeah, 14 ohms, thank you. All right, so this is now the resistance we can add to the circuit here to get two milliseconds turned on. Now let's see how we turn this circuit off. So turn on means that this transistor is operating and current flows through it. But what happens if that transistor is not uh, operating, the transistor is on, that's the turn off time. Now the turn off time, we need to provide an alternative path for the current. Current is trapped in an inductor. If you open this, the current has nowhere to go, hence the diode. And at turn off time, the current would dissipate in this inner loop. This would be the I off. Now notice that the, transist the, the uh, inductor reverses polarity. Now this diode is forward biased. And this is now the I off path for the current. Now, this is the freewheeling diode that we used before from lecture four. We want this to be, to have a, uh, let's see here, I off. We want this to be one millisecond. What is the value of this resistor now that we added here to dissipate energy? This resistor will be calculated by tau equals to L over one plus RF. And you want this to be one millisecond. So following the same procedure we had here, 30 milli divided by one plus R equals to one, we can calculate RF and RF should be 29 ohms. If we add the resistor of 29 ohms there, then the rotor uh, turns off in one millisecond. That's the time constant for the rotor. Okay, and that's why the diode is there. Very well, so this is the, the, the circuit, this is the physical motor, and this part here, these three elements, this element, this element, that, and that, this is what we added for the driver. So this is the on-off part, this helps with the time on, and this helps with the time off. So, no problem here, we have three amps flowing through. What is the problem with our approach? We made the rotor faster, by adding resistors. And that doesn't sound like a good idea because resistors dissipate energy. So where is the catch? The motor is gonna have less torque. The motor is gonna have less torque if we consider this voltage to be constant, yes. Well, let's assume that uh, the nominal current is three amps. Right, the nominal current, current is three amps. So in case one, without any at the added current, the voltage would be three times one, three amps times one ohm would be three volts. In case two, the voltage now becomes three amps times one plus what we added here, which was, where is it? 15, 14, 14 ohms. Yeah, 14 ohms. And now it jumps to 45 volts. Uh -huh. So we made the system faster, but it now takes 45 volts to develop the same torque as before. So as suggested, otherwise, if we assume that this voltage is constant, then the motor will be faster, but it will develop less torque. If you want to maintain the same torque, we need to bump up the voltage to 45 volts. Right. So here is the, is the actual trade-off. Okay. Any, any questions here? So if it for the for the third one, would it be would it take 90 volts? The third one doesn't take 90 volts because the third one is happening inside here. It's happening inside there. There is 
sorry, when this take when this is operating, there is no need for a power source. It's actually the power source is not delivering current at all because this is open. Right, so it only takes 45 volts to do three amps on time turn on, and when it's turned off, so this is open, there is no current flowing from the power source, so it doesn't matter because it's just dissipating energy there. Okay, all right, any, any other uh, questions? Any other questions? No? Okay, so if there are no questions, let's do this one. Consider the reluctance motor shown. Determine the sequence of actuation, activation for a 30 degree step. I'm not gonna use the light part for this one. It's relatively simple. What is the sequence of actuation for a 30 degree step and let's do uh let's do counterclockwise let's do clockwise let's do that clockwise so what would be the freak the sequence of actuation for a clockwise 30 degree rotation so first let me give you the hardest one we do a so it's aligned here and now we want to go clockwise what would be the next one B? A, B. A, B. Yeah, A, B if you want to do 15 degrees. Correct. A, B if you want to do 15 degrees. If you want to do 30 degrees, then it would simply be B. All right, so then P2 aligns with B. And what would be the next one? That would be? Now would be A, B, would it? No, never mind. Would be C. We are doing thirty yeah. degrees, right? That would be oh, C. Oh, still. Oh, okay. yeah. And that would be P three aligning with C. And then we do D, and then you repeat the cycle. So now let's do the fifteen degrees. So what would be fifteen degrees? So this is for thirty degrees. Let's do fifteen degrees. What would how would that look like? Would be A to start, then A B, then A B, C. then what? Then B, uh, B, then B, yeah, then B, C, B, B, C. then B, C, correct. Then we go with um, just C, just C, and then C, D, D, what, what is next? D, A, D, A, and that completes the cycle. Question. Yeah. Sir, why is it for the 30 degrees? So uh, I'm just confused because um, when I saw it, I assumed that that's for the 45 degrees if it's going from A to B to C to D. Uh, sorry, the 45 degrees is it has to do with the resulting field when you actuate A and B at the same time. Right? But the difference, let's say, between P2 and B is 30 degrees. The angle of P2, the axis of P2 and B are 30 degrees apart. So when we actuate B from what we see, P2 aligns with B and moves by 30 degrees. The 45 degrees is only a representation of where the resulting magnetic flux is if we do A, B at the same time. All right, so now the angle between the, the, if you do 45 degrees, if you do A and B, then the difference between the axis of the rotor and the magnetic flux would be 15. And that's, by, and that's the amount it moves. Does that, I'm not sure if I answered your question. So can you repeat it again? I, I used to uh, confuse. For well, which part? for the 30 degree point. All right, so let's look at this example, this example here. The 30 degree angle there represents the distance or the angle between the axis of the rotor at a P2 
and phase B. Is that is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. So when phase B is actuated, then the rotor will align itself with phase B. And to do that, it needs to move clockwise by 30 degrees. Now let's consider the case where we actuate AB. When you actuate AB, then the resulting magnetic flux is no longer at a 90 degree angle pointing to B. It's pointing halfway between A and B at a 45 degree angle. Now the distance, the angular distance between the uh, P2 axis and the resulting magnetic field becomes 15 degrees. And that's where it aligns itself with. So, so for... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask, so are we like making it based off the middle of PB, uh, P2 or the middle of P1? We started, P1 is what gives you, is A. When you actuate A, you go to P1. A goes to P1, or P1 goes to A. When you actuate B, now the closest one to B is P2. Then you're dealing with how P2 moves towards B. It's not A that goes to B. Yeah, sorry, it's not P1 that it goes to B, it's P2 that it goes to B. That's the closest one to phase B. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, it seems that P3 is the same distance uh, from B as P2. So why wouldn't it move counterclockwise? It, it would. Uh, here is it is some sort of indetermination because they are indeed at the same distance. But once we start the sequence, uh, that it doesn't become a problem anymore. All right. So it's just the first step that is a bit confusing. But let's assume for uh, simplicity that a P2 is closer to B. Uh, but you are right as it stands right now, we don't know which one moves where, but once the rotor starts rotating, that it doesn't become a problem. It's, uh, it, it's clear. Okay. So if we do P2 aligns itself to B, the rotor goes clockwise. And in this particular example, if B is actuated, then the difference would be 30 degrees. If you do AB, then P2 aligns with AB, and to do that, it will only take 15 degrees. In a, uh, this is a reluctance motor, so that problem exists in the reluctance motor, but if this was a permanent magnet motor, then uh, that would not be a problem. Because you need to consider where south and north poles are. Okay, so our time is up. I'm going to do one more example anyways, just, uh, so we have it and, uh, and then we stop there. So if you would like to leave, feel free to do so. We are over time, one more time again, but I'll do one more exercise and then post the solutions later. So let's do exercise 56. That's a simple one. We have a variable reluctance motor controlled by a four bit digital signal from a microcontroller. The four bits represent the excitation of phases A to D respectively. For instance, a digital signal 1000 will cause the excitation of phase A and 1110 and cause excitation of B and C. Draw the power circuit to interface the motor with the controller using a unipolar configuration. Write a table for the four bit digital signals for a 45 degree step rotation and uh, Continuous sequencing causes the motor to rotate at a constant speed. What is the number of pulses per second if the motor rotates at 720 RPM? Let's do this one step by step. So let's just start with the problem itself. So this is a reluctance motor and we want a unipolar configuration for this. So how are we gonna do a unipolar configuration to uh, drive this system? Well, if it's unipolar, all we need to do is to use MOSFETs. Right, we are do, doing one, sequ one coil at a time. So we could do, for example, coil A here. We can connect coil A to the power source, so VCC. Take the other end of coil A and put a transistor through that through a transistor.
that through a transistor. Let me do this properly. It's too close there, like that. And then the transistor here goes to the ground. And now you can take phase A right here and connect phase A through a resistance that it goes there. So this is a resistance. So when A is activated, when you have a high logical signal here, let's say five volts, it triggers this transistor and then current flows through coil A to the ground. And then we do this, of course, four times because uh, we need one per coil. Okay, so now we have one per coil, so A actuates A and so on. So now let's do our table here, A, B, C, D values and phase and angle. So this is phase and this is going to be the angle of rotation. So if you do phase A, that would be one for A, zero for B, zero for C, zero for D. What would be the phase activated? That would be phase A and what would be the angle? Zero degrees. Zero degrees, yeah, zero degrees. Now we can do for a 45 degree rotation, what is the next one? B. It will be, be zero, one, uh, sorry, one, one, zero, zero. Exactly, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, because now you want the motor to go to A, B, All right? So I heard the B, as one of the possible answers, that would be correct for a 90 degree rotation. And for a 45 degree, you go halfway here, so that would be 45 degrees. What is the next one? B. Zero, one, zero, zero. Yeah, zero, one, zero, zero, that it goes to B, and it goes to 90 degrees. What is the next? Zero, one, one, zero. That it goes to BC. And what is the angle? 135 degrees. Question. And then you go, yeah. And in, in this case, just because there's only two, um, I, I don't know what you call them, fins on the router, is it just because there's only, I guess, one in the top half, the nearest one? How do I explain this? The, there's only one nearest rotor, so it's going aligning fully with the flux line, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah, you can discard. Let, assume, for example, to see more clearly, assume that this part here doesn't exist. Okay. All right. So it's ju just this this pole here being dragged along. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and then the sequence continues, right? But the interfacing here is very straightforward. It's just a MOSFET and a resistor coming from the microcontroller. Interestingly, the all the power comes from here, doesn't come from the microcontroller. Next question says, continuous sequencing causes the motor to rotate at a constant speed. What is the number of pulses per second if the motor rotates at a 720 RPM? What is the number of pulses per second? That means how many pulses are coming out of the microcontroller. How many pulses does it take to do a full rotation? How many pulses does it take to do a full rotation? Eight. 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 Yeah, it takes exactly eight pulses to do a full rotation. If this is rotating at 720 RPM, well, this is divided by 60, this is 12 rotations per second. All right, so how many pulses we have per second? If one rotation takes eight and is rotating at 12 rotations per second, then the pulses per second is 12 times eight, 96 pulses per second, All right? And now we can see uh, if we are doing one coil at a time, that if this is too high, this pulses per second is too high, the coils don't have enough time to develop the current fully, and then the rotor will start to lose torque, right? And in the example we saw before, it had a 30 millisecond response time. That's huge in a, in a system like this. 
uh, that's what limits the speed of these motors. You can clearly see that the advantage now, if you tell it to go to coil position A, it goes to A, it doesn't matter, it doesn't need the position feedback, it doesn't need feedback control, but because of the inductance of the coils, there is a very, it can only do that at a very low speed. Hey, sir, can you okay. explain why is it A again? Uh, if you start from A to go back to A, you need to switch it uh, eight times. So A, A, B, uh, the A, then it goes A, B, then it goes B, 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 C, and, and it completes the cycle in eight pulses. So we go here 180, then 225, 270, 313, 313, and then the next one would be the same one there. We don't need to repeat it. And it would be the same one as eight. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Is there anything else that is interesting here that we can do that's short? I think that's uh, most of it. So I think we will stop here today. So if you have any questions, let me know by email. I have office hours starting at 10. You can discuss there. So I think this is a uh, general overview. There's a lot of information about a stepper motor. So go through the lecture one more time if some things are not clear and let me know if you have any questions. Are there any last minute questions? Uh, question. Yeah. So uh, the solutions that we found for exercise 53, uh, yep. would part A result in clockwise and part B result in counterclockwise? Just for clarification. Sorry, you are correct. So the first one is clockwise, the second one is counterclockwise. Yeah, okay. you are correct. Right. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. Any Anything else? Any other questions? No, very well then. Have a good day. I'll see you later during office hours. I'm sorry. Can I just ask yep. a quick question? Sure. So for the um, exercise 56, if we go down to um, DA, like all the way at 315, uh, I'm just, it would be 1001, right? If you do 1001, yeah, that would be the last one before we go back to A. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.